Hello, James here from the Matter of Facts podcast. Before we start the show, I wanted to let you know we recorded this episode the second week of May, two weeks before the devastating fires in our local area. For that reason, you won't hear us referencing these tragic events, and you'll notice Alec and I injecting our usual brand of humour into the show. At the time we recorded this, like you, we were both looking forward to a great, positive month ahead, and we were unaware of the struggles so many people would shortly be facing. Alec, myself, and the entire Matter of Facts podcast team send our deepest sympathies and our best wishes to everyone who is directly or indirectly affected by the fires. If I'm reading the calendar correctly, it is June. It's beautiful out there. And season two of Matter of Facts. Congrats, Alex. Wow. The- Alex. Oh shit! Wow. Why the hell did I say wow. I'd never call you that? You know, Let me start great, again. No, what a great start to season two. You no, wanna, no, 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 that's fine. You want to keep fine. it in? No, keep it in, man. My, my full name is Alexander, so but parents go with Alec, and it's okay. It happens. It happens. You can call me Alex. Anyways, yes, James, congratulations to you as well, uh, Jim. It's been great this whole time, Jimothy, Jimothy, Jim, James, Jimothy. One year of matter of facts. Um, we ended it off with a bang with our last episode with the premiere. So that was a good way to go. We're very excited to get kick-started here on Season 2 of Matter of Facts on this beautiful Tuesday morning in Halifax. It's, uh, it's early very, morning. Yeah, early morning. We very rarely do an early morning episode. But now that I think about it, it's, it might be the most convenient time for us. It is 4 a.m. right now. No, it's not quite <laughs> that early. But no, it's good to be here. And we're going to shake things up on, on this season. We, we're not going to do it on this episode. To be honest, Alec and I, in our day jobs, because we, we do have meaningful, gainful employment as well, believe it or not. We try. Are extremely busy. And uh, we are going to get there, though. So we're going to stick with some of our traditional little segments in this episode. Are you ready to kick it off? Yeah, let's just get right into it. Okay. Insane is the crane. Insane is the crane. Insane is the crane. Insane is the crane. Kinda insane like the crane. Insane is the crane. Insane is the crane. So this insane is the crane is a real insane. Insane is the crane. Insane is the crane. We're going to be talking about everybody's favorite local rock station, Q104, who are no stranger to uh, controversy and shaking things up a little bit, and their baby grand contest, which was dramatically announced, and as quickly as it came, it then imploded in on itself. So I'm just going to give everybody some background, because there's not a lot out there about this, because they've worked very hard to bury it. But basically, back in April, the station announced their Baby Grand contest with the strap line, it's time to get frisky with the Mighty Q's Baby Grand. So these were the rules, if that you wanted really to take the part. starting title there? That was it, yeah. And there's some rules if you want to take part. Okay, so they're gonna, they were going to choose four couples to come into the studio and pee on a stick. To what? I'm just kidding. <laughs> to come in the studio. Yeah, that happened later. To pee on, the, on a stick, just, just the ladies, to prove that they're not pregnant. So four couples come in and they prove they are not pregnant. Hey. Then they push all the couples out of the door, send them home, and the first couple to get pregnant get $1,000. So it was, you all come in, we establish this baseline that nobody's pregnant, then we kick you out the door, and $1,000 to the first couple who get knocked up. Sponsored by Pleasures and Treasures, to anybody not local, that is Halifax's favorite and most frequented adult store. There was an online form to nominate yourself and your spouse and make the case for why you should be considered as a finalist. So before we go any further, Alec, how does, how does that contest and how do those rules sit with you? It's, I mean, it's, it's something new that shakes it up. Um, in today's world, I can't see how that, um, that will fly. So I'm assuming the next thing we're going to talk about is how shit hit the fan on that one. Pretty quick. Uh, <laughs> pretty quick. I think, I mean, it, you know, it is what it is. I mean, it's hilarious. I mean, there's definitely ways, I feel like there's ways you could, uh, you know, just like in movies and TV shows, when people cheat the drug test, there's probably a way you could cheat that and get that you know, that you're not pregnant, come back in two days later, boom, we're pregnant. We were just uh, like a couple of bunnies for the next couple of days. Um, yeah, that's a weird one. I think it's, uh, I mean, it's different, but I'm interested to hear how 
quickly it blew up. It did, and no sooner had the couples got home and people started losing their you-know-what. Some oh, found God. it funny, others took to Reddit to voice their disgust. The contest went viral globally online with lots of news outlets talking about it. Barely days later then, the following statement appears on the Q104 website. It says, When we designed the Baby Grand promotion for the Q Network in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, we had the intent of having some fun with couples who are planning to become parents. We knew it might be controversial. That's why we created a screening process for couples to ensure we were selecting people who were actually planning to become parents anyway. It's also why we capped the prize money at $1,000. We didn't want to attract anyone who might only be in it for the money. Nobody thinks that $1,000 offsets the cost of having a baby. It barely covers a month of expenses. Or today's world, about three things at Sobeys. Um, hey, hey, Although a backlash in the people's court of social media wasn't unexpected, the in-person harassment at a sponsor location was. Oh. Having anyone react for something that they didn't like by verbally harassing staff members at a local retail location wasn't a low we anticipated, but that's what happened. And then the... Um, kind of expected ending in the interest of the safety of the fine folks who work at that client location we are suspending this promotion we apologize to those who've already entered at this point some of your stories were genuinely touching we wish you the very best of luck in your journey toward parenthood so somebody made the obvious joke that uh, q104 pulled out but like it appears that. that somebody went into pleasures and treasures and harassed them wow i mean it i i i um I'm not against, I don't know what to say about this one. I think it's a bit of an odd idea, an odd plan. Uh, it's almost like who, there's definitely at least one person at, at the regular meetings that, that, that said, put their hand up and said, yeah, I have an idea. It's going to sound crazy. We're going to partner with pleasures, pleasures and treasures, and we're going to force people to bang it out and get a kid as quickly as they can. We'll give them a thousand bucks. I don't know. I think it's a, it's a weird contest. Um, I, th I feel like when they launched it, they had to think something would happen. They had to think that, it would hit the fan and it wouldn't work. It's in, it, it, like I said, in today's world, that's just a weird thing. And there's definitely going to be people against it. Like, like you said, not just, you know, the overall concept of it, but you know, the, the idea that they think, Oh, thousand dollars, that's nothing for child expenses. And that's not what Q104 was saying. It's just a thousand dollars. What are they going to give about $10,000 for this little contest? Well, if you gave a hundred grand, I think some couples might get pregnant. Oh, geez. And I, that, that then enters a new realm. Maybe, of, that, a, maybe a new, that, a new low. Maybe that's how you get your population up. You start giving out a hundred grand prizes. If you're having a baby, basically what they do in the UK where I come from. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Well, and this wow. isn't the first time as well that Q104 have got themselves in hot water. Do you remember the 2012 controversy? That went all the way to Canadian Parliament. I mean, if you, if you give me a little hint, I probably will. Okay, so they had a contest that was called Mail is in the Check. And I'm going to give you uh, the spelling here. So it was mail. So you, it, it's a play on the phrase, check is in the mail. Right. Mail is in a man and check is in somebody from the Czech Republic. So it was called mail is in the check. And the gist here was that men could apply to become one of two finalists to be interviewed on air. And the winner got a flight to Prague and four dates to be used up with local Czech women. The, the bad thing here, they deliberately aligned it for the final to be on May 8th. Uh, sorry, March 8th, uh, which is International Women's Day. And this ended up going as far as the Canadian Whoa. Parliament. MP Megan Leslie apologized to all of the Czech women in Canada for the contest. She said, and I like this, if the brides get here, meaning if the guy goes to the Czech Republic, marries one and brings her to Canada, I'd be happy to show her around and we'll make sure she knows something else Canadian women have won in the last hundred years, the right to a divorce. Ooh. This to me is worse than the baby grand I contest w women are not commodities and i well that's also nuts aligning it for international, international women's, women's day, day. I mean, like you couldn't even do this in the 50s and they were trying to do it no. in 2012 who, like again i say who was at the meeting and put their hand up and everyone said "Ooh, that's a good idea we like what he has to say let's go with that one like it's just those things shouldn't even make it past the table they shouldn't even make it out of the room that's they a probably wild. vetoed the puppy slaughtering idea. and yeah, That one's done. You know, that one there, that's a weird one. And um, good on uh, Mrs. Leslie there to say what she said. She did. And yeah. that one was, that was global news. Like I have people in, not global news is in the outlet, but it went global. I have people in the UK texting me being like, don't you live in Halifax? They didn't have Canadian accents in the UK, but, but don't you live in Halifax? Like what the heck's this? So, yeah. I mean, Q104 need to step it up. I'll tell you though, great radio station, uh, funny, funny oh, yeah. hosts and announcers just... Yeah, a great little job at the creative on the marketing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're good. And 
So Q104 did that one too, right? Yeah, this is so, old Q104. Yeah, it makes, I want to look at the employment records here. I feel like you got one guy there who just kind of sits there at the board meetings and every once in a while he doesn't say anything. He's kind of a sporadic guy. Crazy ideas. He went to Nova Scotia Power. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he left. <laughs> every, every 11 years he just comes up and goes, oh, we should try this. So what's the next one? 2034. There'll be some nut job idea that he's going to bring up. I can't wait to see what it will be. I know. I'm looking forward to it. Then we can talk about it on the podcast as long as we're still in business. Alec Cranston will not use hair product. That, that's oh. it. Oh. Are you making fun of it? Because you can tell I have I hair think product. you look good. So Alec, Alec walked into the studio here wearing a beautiful pair of specs. And, and since I have known Alec, I don't think I've seen you in glasses. Now, I'm also a fellow, a fellow myopic person. I wear contacts, though. Mm. Um, but you, look, you rock the specs. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I was glasses for a bit there. I think when I started with Cushman and Wakefield, I had a set of glasses I used while I was studying for my real estate. That was it when you joined, we called you Big Nerd Boy. Oh, ah. it's all come back now. Oh, yeah, right. Big oh. Nerd Boy. No, I'm kidding. I don't no, remember. No, but I had some glasses. And then, uh, I, anyways, long story short, I have some eye problems. I've had multiple surgeries on my eyes, and my prescriptions changed quite a bit. So I went in recently, and they're like, yeah, your prescription is very different from your previous glasses. You need a new set. And then, uh, yeah, I was looking around, settled on these puppies, Ray Bans, and they're very comfortable and uh, still getting used to them. So it's a little wonky. But uh, I'm happy to finally have them on my face. I like Wonderful. I like, yeah, just right on my face. As long as you're happy. Uh, let's talk weekend parking. Alec, oh, what's up? Yes, I, I brought this up. So I think, I don't know, maybe a two, two episodes ago, maybe three. We talked, maybe, maybe four. Maybe four. Was it five? No, it was three. Seven, no, it was two. Seventeen. 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 Uh, we talked about how weekend parking was uh, coming into effect and then how they were, you know, they were going to start charging on weekends as it is right now. I think it's 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, so you're good in evenings and then Saturdays is free. So you just come downtown, park wherever you want or wherever the, um, the paid parking stalls are. But then they voted for it to come into play and we talked about it for Insane as the Crane. However, recent news, Halifax's budget committee has decided to overturn its prior decision to implement the paid parking in downtown areas on Saturdays after pushback from a number of businesses and associations. It was a narrow eight to nine vote last month. The committee had voted to begin charging and it was two bucks an hour um, in the downtown Halifax and Dartmouth areas on Saturdays. Um, the municipality had estimated that implementing that paid downtown parking on Saturday would bring in an additional $538,000 in revenue for the next fiscal year. Um, I think um, I'm very happy that they've overturned this and there was some pushback. And in the article, um, friend of the podcast, uh, Sue Utech with the uh, Spring Garden Business Commission was one of those people pushing back. And I totally agree. I think... Uh, we need to get Sue on the show. Yeah, she'd be great to hear. She would be a wonderful she just guest. has such good insight to where the city has been. It is and going. Like, She'd be great. Sue, so if you're one of our three listeners, please yeah, reach out. We'll mark it down. Um, yeah, no, I'm, uh, we won't go too deep into this one because we already did go pretty, we went really deep last time. Um, but I will say I'm just happy to hear it's overturned. This is going to get people coming to the city more in the on the weekends and uh, save a few bucks here and there. So, I think yeah, it's man. democracy, right? Now, we all laugh at the fact that the attempted traffic-free Spring Garden Road pilot failed after a couple of days. All right. Uh, you know, that was a decision that wasn't through public consultation, but I like the fact here that the uh, the bowels of the city are working properly. And if bowels people... Of the city. Yeah, and if, if they, they announce something or propose something people don't like, that it goes to a vote and democracy runs its course and we, yeah. we veto it. So I think it's great. And yeah, there was no need to charge for parking downtown. I mean, for me, you can charge everyone else as long as I get an exemption. I, I frankly don't care what the city council does, yeah. but as long as I don't have to pay for parking, we're all good. Yeah, and I'm soon going to have to pay for parking. I mean, right now I walk to work uh, by moving over to Dartmouth in two weeks. So I'll be taking the ferry if I can, but most days I'll be driving in and looking to park somewhere. But yeah, now I walk. Like I walked to the studio this morning and... I got to say, hot take, a very humbling experience walking downhill downtown Halifax. You know, you could be in a suit, you could be going to something serious, you could be all intense, but you, you catch yourself walking down the hill and you got a bit of an extra step and you're shaking your shoulders a bit and you feel kind of you're like, what am I doing right now? This is kind of dancing to this walk down the hill. I'm like, are people looking at me? And you kind of catch yourself. You're like, this, is a, this is a bit much. And then likewise, walking up the hill, burn all the calories you ate during the day. Exactly. Well, um, people say, what is Halifax to me? And I say, it's an experience of walking uphill and then downhill. That's the city. Yeah, like I, I, it's embarrassing, but I'll be sometimes out of breath when I start at the bottom of Duke Street and walk up to my apartment. So looking forward to not having to do that anymore because once I'm in Dartmouth, 
ferry over, and our office is just level with the ferry right there. You will replace it with traffic. So there's the toss-up. Would I rather walk up and down a hill? I'll tell you, it took me 55 <laughs> minutes to get in from Bedford this morning. 55, 55? minutes. And you would have left at what, like 7.45? Yeah, I left just before 7.30. Really? Yeah. 55 so minutes? So I would probably trade that for a walk. Yeah. Not having to listen to the same old stuff on the radio and watch the same old douchebaggery on the... Um, the the highway there like yeah drivers you know, i i have a front and a rear dash cam and i'm very thankful i do because one day oh, i'm yeah, going I've to seen your need rear. i've seen your rear you've yeah. seen my rear you've seen the camera right yeah. you've seen the camera my rear <laughs> i i'm going to need that one day to get me either out of something people somebody accuses me of or to prove that somebody else was responsible because the traffic here is insane but we Always we're not going to go down that because we could have an entire podcast dedicated to halifax traffic uh, entire season entire season our guest has just knocked at the uh, the door and we have a great guest today so let's go and shake his hand and bring him in sounds good we are thrilled to be joined in the matter of facts studio by john wedburn john is the senior advisor of communications and external relations for the office of mayor mike savage great to have you on john thank you very much what do you think of the view from here isn't it we always ask Not our bad. guests about that they always comment on the view what do you think it never ceases to amaze me there's always something going on on our wonderful uh, waterfront boardwalk and in Dartmouth, I uh, see there's a massive, I'm going to call it a ship crane over there, which totally boggles my mind because of the <laughs> size of it, and I can't believe it's still afloat. So We yeah. saw this thing earlier as well the first time. There's no context for our listeners, but it's got a bunch of, like, pipes, or there's just always something happening uh, happening in the harbor. It, it kind of verifies why this is a great city. Yeah. And, and John, you're in, you're in the thick of what is happening in our city. So tell us a bit about your role within the office of the mayor. You know, we, we've always said this on the podcast. We love Mike Savage. He's such a great advocate for, for our city. Um, it, he, he could always leave and become a stand-up comedian if he wanted to as well. He's the <laughs> funniest guy at every event we go to. We don't see a lot of what happens behind the scenes, and you have a very yeah. unique role in his office. So mm -hmm. maybe tell us a bit about that and um, what your role is and what's keeping you busy. Yeah, no, I think that uh, you've kind of summed him up pretty accurately what you see is truly really what you get with the mayor he's a really awesome guy we were lucky to have him i think you know over the last 10 years he's really focused on his tenure on making halifax a, a better place for everyone you know for a long time uh, the city was stagnant in growth and development and uh you know he decided to sort of flip the switch on that and uh we're willing to take uh what does he put it i think he the way he says it is uh, I'd rather have the problems with growth than the problems with stagnancy, right? At least we can work with those problems with growth and and uh, and continue to grow. Stagnancy is a different issue, and uh, it's, it sort of drags us and holds us all down. So yep. I would say uh, he's uh, he is a pretty funny guy, but uh, hmm. he takes his work very seriously. And uh, at the end of the day, he's he is truly putting the city first. That's the distinction I think with with Mayor Mike Savage is you know when we see him at events and he he is a staunch supporter of. Well, I think he's actually cloned many times because I don't know how one guy can show up to everything he's we go everywhere. to. Uh, he, he's not in my car in the morning, but I think he's everywhere <laughs> else. Um, and he is he is such a likable character, uh, and, he, and he's so outgoing, but does really serious, hard graft behind the scenes. Uh, so what is your role within his office? Yeah, so um, there's, uh, I guess, six of us in the office, a couple of policy advisors, of which I'm one of the two that are there. My focus is external relations and communications, and... You know, it is just that, you know, relating to folks externally, talking to people. We get inquiries about the city all the time. And a lot of people, I blame TV for this, think that the mayor's the guy they want to pick up the phone and talk to, you know, because that's what they see on TV. <laughs> yeah, be the mayor. That would be the, yeah, I want to talk to the mayor. Um, <laughs> and that's not necessarily the case. So often at times I'm making those callbacks to those people or to those individuals or the, to those groups. And it's quite funny because the first thing they'll say is, um, why are you calling me? <laughs> and my response is, well, I'm trying to figure out if I can solve your problem before yeah. <laughs> before the mayor needs to solve the problem. You know, behind the mayor, though, is a great, I'll say, uh, organization or network of people and individuals with a, an enormous amount of brain trust that are capable of solving not all the problems, but most of the problems that people have out there. Yep. And um, it's part of my job is to sort of navigate the way through to figure out who can solve this is specific issue on this specific day or time, and then hand it over to staff and let them do what they do best. You know, I don't claim to know everything, and I would never try to do that. And I would never try to solve the problem, but I do know how to find the resources I can. And that's really what my role is on the on the relations side. On the comms side, um, you know, we do a lot of writing. If it's not speeches, yeah. you know, it's reports, it's briefing documents. 
keeping the mayor up to date on things that are going on in the community so that, you know, he is able to speak to them intelligently and with, uh, uh, and bring a perspective to those things to, you know, that's realistic um, and not just sort of out there left field. Sure, sure. Okay. We're learning a lot here so far. So part of the reason we wanted you in today was to discuss some of the African Nova Scotia groups and initiatives that you work with and you liaise with and you have exposure to. And and we feel it's a really important conversation. And we actually wanted to to take it away from Black History Month and have it at at a time when we could focus on it properly and it maybe wasn't diluted. Um, So can you speak to some of your work on on that front? Yeah, so um, I'm a long-time Haligonian. I've had the opportunity to work with many of the organizations that uh, had been established, I'll say over, now I can honestly say decades, <laughs> um, that have come to exist to support African Nova Scotian culture, entrepreneurship, housing. Uh, it's a pretty broad spectrum when you actually sit down and look at it. I guess to start off, my first engagement or involvement would have been with the Black Business Initiative back in the uh, early, mid, late, I'm going to say late 90s, <laughs> Black <laughs> Business Initiative in the late 90s. And I spent a bit of time with them when they were working on, you know, getting entrepreneurship skills out to the African Nova Scotia communities across the province. Pretty broad mandate because there was nothing in place prior to that. And the number of um, African Nova Scotian entrepreneurs, I'd say probably you could count on one hand, you know, um, and that was across the province. So their mandate was to work on, you know, creating an um, environment of supports and mechanisms to help those entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs or people that want to consider entrepreneurship and move them up to the next level. And, uh, you know, I'd say some 20, 30 years later, um, it's still in existence today and has a broad swath of, uh, I'll say, success stories behind them. Um, so there's more to be done. And I think at this stage of the game now, uh, They've just recently announced a new executive uh, director or CEO would be the title there. Um, Rustam Southwell was the past um, head of the organization, and Matthew Martell was recently appointed there. So it's sort of moving that into a a next generation phase, if you will. Um, And uh, I think uh, Matthew's done a lot of great work within the organization and will bring, you know, the right kind of leadership going forward. So on the entrepreneurship side, on the business side, the business development side, that's sort of the role that... uh, I uh, played it within that organization, um, and it was great. I really enjoyed it. And then, yeah, I got into the comms business sort of shortly after that. Um, there was sort of a gap, at least what I thought was a gap, for black businesses, um, specifically for the communications, uh, support, marketing, stuff that they would need. So I tried to fill that void. And I worked as an independent contractor, sort of finding clients, providing services. You know, it was... I guess they say eat what you kill. So I was out there. Oh, we're in that world soul. too. Yeah. But Alec and I, uh, Alec is two years into that world. Yeah. You're loving it, right? Oh, man. Every day. <laughs> yeah. Loving it. Yeah. You start from zero every day. And, yeah. And you got I, unemployed. Yeah, I tell my wife, I wake up every morning unemployed. It's a good, it's a good way of putting it. You never know who's going to call. That's what I get so excited. Ghostbusters. I know it sounds terrible, but I look forward to Mondays because Saturdays and Sundays are going to die down. Yeah. And I know Mondays things kick back up again. You never know who's going to walk through the door, call yeah. you on the phone, text you. So it's just. Part of the yeah. excitement every day. Yeah, and it truly is. You know, you have to have a specific mindset, I think, or at least uh, there's something inside you that sort of embraces that. You know, I know people that say, they, I could never do that. They need no. that stability, that sort of, I know that that's going to happen for me the next day. And I've always been sort of a, I think embrace we're the chaos. Yeah. yeah embrace yeah. the chaos. <laughs> Life is like that. Yeah. And, no. uh, I, I enjoy it. Or uh, I did enjoy it anyway. Um, and then through that experience, you know, I, began to really learn and understand the type of work that some of the organizations were doing throughout the African Nova Scotia community. And, you know, I guess over the years, I had the opportunity to work with several of them. Um, and that would include the likes of, uh, um, yes, the Black Business Initiative, more on the comm side, providing communication support. Um, I worked with the Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute and specifically um, provided communications, I'll say support or leadership to the organization. It had recently come to into existence um, through a proposal and funding through the Department of Educa- Advanced Education and Early Childhood Development. Um, yeah, and uh, I worked with them for about a year as a contract and then moved into a full-time role with them and stayed with them for uh, four years um, in the comms world. And then through restructuring, I got moved back into the 
uh, contract world uh, again, which was kind of interesting because in that time span, more opportunities sort of presented themselves in the contract side of things, oddly enough. And uh, so I jumped on and took some uh, work with the uh, uh, folks at the Decade for People of African Descent Coalition, also known as the ANSD Pad. And, uh, you know, that was a United Nations initiative that was set up to provide a voice for African, I'll say, people of African descent globally. And specifically, the Nova Scotia branch was looking at providing the voice for African Nova Scotians. And uh, they did some great work. They're still in existence today. They're still doing some great work. Their mandate expires, I think, from the UN funding block in 2024. But, uh, you know, hopefully they'll still be going strong and doing the great work that they do. Um, and that would cover a pretty broad swath of, every, of, uh, of things. They were looking at justice at the time. They were looking at uh, education. They were looking at uh, entrepreneurship, e economic development. So they were, I guess, a body that was advocating on behalf of organizations and individuals within the African Nova Scotian community. And uh, uh, out of a little shop in Dartmouth is what they were doing. And uh, I think they were having, they still, they're still having some great success in doing that. So it's pretty cool. Um, they were successful in setting up the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute, which is a new organization, um, which is really going to be focusing on um, the justice system and its um, interaction and approach with African Nova Scotians, you know, and that could cover everything from policing to incarceration and, you know, everything in between. So uh, those support mechanisms are, are required out there, are needed out there, because I believe the stats show that due to this, uh, we have such a small proportion of the population, but such a large proportion of the incarcerated population, and right. uh, those numbers don't sort of jive. They don't really reflect that, reality. That is a huge, huge disparity. Yeah. 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 So um, really good work with them. Um, the Association of Black Social Workers is another organization um, that I had the pleasure of working with as well. And I guess on the lighter side, if I can call it that, uh, maybe a little less stressful would be the uh, group out of uh, ANZMA, which is the African Nova Scotia Music Association, you know, and they're promoting and highlighting African Nova Scotian artists. We've got a real hotbed, I believe, here of talent that's been under-recognized and underutilized, and um, ANZMA is working on making sure that uh, artists in that field or artists in music um, are getting an opportunity to showcase their, their, their abilities and their skills. Yeah. That's pretty cool, too. Yeah. Um, you know, there's not an area, uh, you know, that the community doesn't, doesn't touch um, that we're involved in. Um, but traditionally, there just haven't been the supportive mechanisms there. So it's been, a you know, a slog and a battle for, I think, the African Nova Scotia community. But they've managed to endure. They've managed to, you know, continue on. And, you know, with the supports and mechanisms in place um, now, I think that, uh, you know, we'll probably see... You know, if it was leveling off, there should be a spike again. You know, in the coming years, there's a lot of youth involved in it now. There's a lot of the youth leaders involved in it now that are very passionate about the work that they're doing. And I think it's a great time and a great opportunity. And I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. Clearly a very busy guy. You have put yeah. your dues in well, across a number of very worthy organizations. When I came here from the UK, Africville was the first real local story that I, I heard about when I started researching things and to people um, who are c coming from far away or visitors or just researching, when you look at the African Nova Scotia community, Africville is really the first thing that you hear about. What is that community up to today? Wow. Um, there's a lot of great stuff going on there, and I think that the opportunities um, are limitless. Uh, I guess geographically, it's it's that that point or that part of the city that you know hadn't been recognized that you know existed as it did some I guess 50 60 years ago almost for the African Nova Scotia community and you know it was a very difficult um, event that took place there and displacing that community and then relocating that community and it never did recover to its I'll say its grandeur that it that it would have had you know without really I don't live there. I'm not directly connected. I've had 
dealings with, my family's had dealings with folks that have been involved in Africville. Bill. Um, but I think, you know, we can't ignore the history. It's impacting where we are today, and it's going to influence our future as well with regards to Africville. Bill. And I think that there's a chance that, or there's an opportunity to really do something amazing down there for the community, for the historical community of Africville. Um, I believe they're having, they're celebrating their 40th anniversary actually this year. So I guess that gives me a timeline since the displacement by Africville. And that celebration, I think, will be a real opportunity to showcase, you know, the community itself. Obviously, how that was handled back in the 60s when they displaced the population down there was, you know, not good. And I do believe that, you know, working with the information they people had at the time, they made the best decisions that they should have, could have made. Um, were they necessarily good decisions? Maybe not, um, obviously not, but I think there's an opportunity, you know, to do better going forward. And I think, you know, with the energy and the people that are involved in Africville um, Heritage Trust and the Genealogy Society, they are making sure they will do whatever they can to ensure that, you know, there's a uh, positive impact and outcome that comes out of how things get settled uh, with Africa. It is an important story, and I've not been through the education system here, Alec. It, it's it's taught locally, right? You, to yeah, be to be polite here, you you're closer to your your high school career than I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> high school in fact, no, you you should both. You're, you're ten 2015, years younger. Twenty fifteen. So and, and I, of course, grew up thousands of miles away. You know, hopefully, it is it is an important part of our history that you had exposure to through the local school system. Yeah, I've, I don't know. Yeah, no, I found growing up in, in elementary and junior high n- not as much as it should have. And once once I got to high school, and so I was in high school from 2012 to 2015, that's when it started to kind of come in. We had specific classes to uh, highlight African-Canadian history, which was great. Um, I took one in grade 11 and grade 12. Um, it's great to see. I think there's a lot more programs and classes being offered at schools now, and especially at Citadel High. I'm still involved with them. For, for sports, um, and that was actually going to be one of the topics I was going to bring up was was sports and the access to sport, and that's kind of my big thing is youth sports, and you mentioned the youth getting involved, um, and you know working. I work with Hockey Nova Scotia as well, and our big one of our big mandates is diversity, equity, and, inclu- and inclusion, access for all to sport. Um, I was going to ask you if there's any any programs you're associated with or or that you advocate for uh, sport wise with uh, with regards to the African Canadian community. So previous to being called Citadel, I was a student at uh, Queen Elizabeth High School. I uh, had the, I guess, the benefit or pleasure and honor of playing football under Mike Tanner and, mm. and Bob Douglas. Mike Tanner still coaching to this yes, day. I know Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, youth in sport, I believe I've got two daughters. Both of them, you know, did dance. Um, my philosophy on life is dance is great. And my eldest daughter's really had a passion for that. And I'm really, you know, dumbfounded and gobsmacked by some of the stuff that she would do during <laughs> dance, you know. And I was always wondering, how am I getting my money's worth out of this, right? And there'd be a couple of uh, recitals a year that you get to go to, one on Father's Day. Hey, nice. uh, and my other daughter, both daughters played soccer. So, you know, for my wife and I, and I've always been a team sport guy, right? I think that team sport is probably the most important thing you can get your kids involved in. It taught me how to deal with different types of people in different types of situations, which I think I can apply to life on an ongoing basis. You know, I can pretty well recognize somebody that can handle pressure pretty good pretty fast Mm -hmm. and somebody that can't, you know. Um, And I think that's because of sports, right? You're thrust into a situation that you may not know is coming at any given moment and are you going to be able to rise up and manage that situation um, at any given time? And I think that's a transferable skill that you can apply to life. You know, you get called upon to be the guy that does a podcast for two guys that give you a call, right? Are you going to rise up to that occasion? And you know, or you go into that meeting or you're, you know, doing that presentation. So I think sports is a great grounding for that. Yeah. Um, and that's been sort of our mantra. So our girls got involved and, you know, I constantly sort of try to reiterate that to them and saying, so, you know, handling situations, difficult situations, delicate situations, sport, I think can really help people to, to do that. 
So that's an important piece of that side of things. Um, on the diversity and inclusion side, I think, you know, access has always been a challenge, I think, for a sport like the hockey you mentioned, right? And yeah. I know that, you know, I know Dean Smith very well and yep. uh, the work that he's done with Hockey Nova Scotia. Um, and I know that he was up recently for award. I don't know if he did. Willie O'Reilly really Award. Uh, he was nominated. I don't know if they've yeah. announced the winner yet. Right. I know I voted every day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I did the same thing. <laughs> But I think it's, you know, involvement and finding mechanisms for, I think, the broader community to understand how you can bring in those underrepresented groups to have them participate. And I think, you know, when that happens, it takes a lot of that, the, the stigmas and the siloing out of those, a lot of the sports. Yeah. Hockey, hockey's been traditionally a white, um, a white sport. Why? Because it costs money, ice times, equipment, coaching, all that stuff. And... You know, once you move those barriers out of, out of the way, more people will get involved, right? Yeah. And I think that applies to life, too. You know, the more barriers we can we can move out of the way or get out of the way or silos we can move out of the way, the more people we get involved. And I think it raises everything up once that happens. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the, the, the city's growing. Alec and I, we think there's a bright future here. I, I do, don't you? I'd like very confident. So. I'd like to think so. Yeah. All, all, all of our guests, I think you'd agree as well, John. We have a bright future in in the city here. Um, on the the diversity and, and the inclusion front, you know, wh- wh- where is where is the city going? What what should we all be doing to support the African Nova Scotia community and ensure that that the voice is heard? Uh, and and you know, they, they always say that these initiatives and these groups, it would be great one day if they didn't have to exist. Like, how, how can we move into a, a society locally that is truly inclusive will we i don't know if anybody's got the answer to that question yet to be honest with you it's a it's a tough question i think the obvious answers are ones that you know a lot of the community isn't ready to hear yet you know that you know if we simply did this it could make life a lot better for everyone but i still think that there's that traditional um segment that feels that they need to protect what they have. And I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon, in all honesty. But that doesn't mean you don't keep, you know, pecking away at it until, you know, it may take 10 years, it may take 20 years. We've come a long way. I still believe that there's still a long way to go. Um, And for me, and I don't, you know, want to sort of dilute anything, but I think Halifax going forward will be an amazing multicultural city more so than um, than we have. Yes, it's a beautiful city, great town, a lot of stuff going on, but I think there's a lot more to be had by including more of the diverse groups and communities that are coming here and trying to find their way to make this place, uh, make this place their home. We see that all the time, you know, with key events and celebrations that a lot of these groups have. And I think it's, uh, it bodes us well to be more welcoming, you know, to walk down the street, to see different people, to hear different languages, to smell different foods, you know, to have these type of cultural festivals and or celebrations um, can only enhance the space, right? Because if it's warm and conducive to one, it's going to bring someone else. They're going to tell someone else. You know, I get calls all the time that, you know, Halifax is changing, it's turning into Toronto, and, and, you know, my first response is, we're never going to be a Toronto. It's, you know, for all the people that want us to be, sorry, I don't think that'll ever happen here. Move to Toronto. Yeah, if you want to be (laughs) Toronto, move to Toronto. Toronto, And the people that are here, I think, you know, um, that I hear that from tend to be people that I won't say are... I'm going to say they're on the sunset side of things, right? It's what they remember. It's the city, how they remember seeing Halifax as it was um, and haven't or won't be able to make the adjustment to, I call it the before times, and I don't mean before COVID. (laughs) (laughs) You got to specify now. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But a lot of people sort of feel that way, and, um, and to me I'm like, yeah, you know, Honestly, that's not going to happen anytime, let alone anytime soon. Um, but yeah, the city's going to change. And, you know, my response to those people now is, you know, there's a lot of things in life that happen. There's 
I like to think three things that, you know, are guaranteed. And I say taxes, death, and change would be the third one. Yes. And everything's going to change. Eventually it has to change. So, you know, you may not like it, but. But embrace all three of those. Yeah. You got to, you got to, you got to get it. Get on board. Even if you don't like it. Even yeah. if you don't like it. You I don't find like the taxes part, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking forward to the death part either. Uh, so. <laughs> no, those, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been a great discussion, John. We're so pleased you could join us today. And uh, there's a lot more work for everybody to to do. And, and we're pleased that there's folks out there that are carrying out some uh, some really important work locally. So we'll have you back on at some point yep. if you're happy. We'd love to bring you back and sure. and uh, make this a regular thing. Really appreciate it. No, I really appreciate you guys having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. And I'm looking forward to... Yeah, maybe coming back. Yeah. At least hearing who else you guys get to interview and uh, and enjoy this great view again. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thanks. Wow, that was awesome. That was great. Sean was a incredible guest to have on. Uh, it was funny, we were saying it was one of those interviews where it was great just to listen to him talk. I didn't say very much because I just, I really enjoyed listening to what he had to say yeah. and yeah. talking about the different initiatives and organizations and just his overall role in it all. Um, definitely somebody I'd like to have back on the podcast at some point, but that was great. Yeah, I think so. And, and Alex, correct. Normally we're very structured with our interviews and we, yeah. we kind of corral our guests and say, Hey, we want to bring you on, but, uh, we're going to talk about this and you're going to talk about this. But we, we <laughs> invited John in with a true open mic and, and, um, Bill McAvoy, our managing director has known John a long time and, and has told us about the great work he's done. So we just wanted to, to get it straight from John. So very grateful he could join us. Yes, Definitely. Um, all right. So we're into season two. We're, we're taking out, I think we, we alluded to this in season one. We're taking out new kids in the block. Nothing against that, uh, that segment. Um, it's just, it's just shitty. It's just a shitty segment. I'll, yeah, I, I totally agree. There are some great businesses opening up uh, this summer. I'm sure, um, that we'll, we'll mention, but they don't need a full segment where we kind of dive in and go through promos and how they built their space. We don't need that. Uh, and there's too many businesses to choose from. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's chains and stuff like that. And they don't need recognition. No offense. I'm happy to work with you, though. Um, anyways. Over oh, 2,500 bucks, <laughs> we'll give you a 30-second spot on the yes, podcast. Yes, abs- Tim Hortons. Absolutely, cash. Um, <laughs> absolutely. So we will have some new segments uh, in the further episodes. But just to keep it fresh with you guys and to keep it uh, what you know, we're going to stick to our OG segments today. Uh, that being said, we are going to kick it off into the Reddit Roundup. Reddit Roundup. Highly gonians losing their minds over minor inconveniences. I think Reddit's been pretty active this month, hasn't I it, Alan? I agree. I, I actually found some great topics uh, on Reddit. It was uh, There were some good ones. There were some, I think we actually, the ones I found on, well, are insane as the crane, I found one of them the saturday night parking there was a whole whole spew of uh comments on that one i could have got into but uh, i found a couple of good topics uh we both did and he I'll, I'll read off one i like i actually realized i didn't save the actual original comment but i think i remember what it was so it it refers to paying it forward do you want me to read it yeah do you have it i do have okay it. please do yeah I'll, th- I'll throw back to alec after this just um, to give give you some concept throw it back just keep going. Oh, pay it forward, throw it back. There's throw a it back, throw it back. There's, keep a, going. there's a wrap there somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so the title was, uh, who is the user here? It was Bob Sackamanux. <laughs> so title just ended another pay it forward chain at a Tim's <laughs> drive through <laughs> This is like evil, f- <laughs> evil, evil man. <laughs> this is like the fourth time for me now. This trend is so effing dumb. Like, let's say 50 people in a row do it. It's only the person, the the only person who benefits is the last car. Meanwhile, a bunch of people are paying for things they didn't order, and it's going to be annoying for the staff. Here's a crazy idea. Just pay for your own goddamn order. No confusion. Everybody's happy. Oh, my God. Oh, right. That that was the (laughs) rent. Well, that's uh, that's their uh, villain origin story right there, ending the pay it forward chain. Uh, interesting. Uh, I know exactly what they mean. I actually don't know if I've ever been part of a pay it forward chain where somebody's paid for my drink or anything. I don't think I've ever been part of one, nor have I, I haven't done it in a drive through. Um, I know my, I'll give a show to my mom. I know my mom loves to do it whenever she sees uh, a military personnel at a restaurant or McDonald's, she always pays for their meal. Um, that's a, that's a pay it forward. We don't, we, we don't expect them to pay it 
forward even further because they do enough service as it is. So quick thank you uh, to that. And so this guy, there's one comment I thought was funny. Uh, I have a few comments, but we'll go back and forth just so you well, and I don't cross over too much. though, how does this guy even know he's part of a pay-it-forward chain? He doesn't know what the cars in front of him have done. It could have been one in isolation. True. Yeah, that's a good point. He does not know that, How do you he? know? It was like five or ten. It could have been just one guy. And then you could just, you didn't end it. You just got paid forward. Now, and like the whole idea of pay it forward isn't necessarily to just keep the chain going and paying and paying and paying. Because eventually you're going to get to a big bill. Someone who order, has a full family in the van. Um, it's just to, you get your coffee paid for. Now go do something else good somewhere else, wherever it may be. Um, I saw somebody funny. It said, that Islander guy, I pay <laughs> it backwards. I get to the window and say the guy behind me is paying my order, grab my food, and speed off. That's the old five-finger discount. <laughs> the five-finger discount. The old five-finger <laughs> discount, yeah. I love it. They pay it backwards. That was, that was a good one. Do you have a comment? I don't want to read them all off that I have in case uh, you know, I steal some thunder from yeah, you. Yeah, there, there was one here from uh, I Aim Degree. I don't know these Reddit usernames. <laughs> they get even crazier, don't they? Um, I never understood this trend. If it ever happens to me, I'd like to think I'd pay it forward by tipping the person Ooh. giving me the order. The people behind me are already planning to pay for this stuff. And this is my issue with it the only time i've ever done this i was with a guy i used to work with and we were in a car and uh, we went through tim's and we got to the the window and the lady said it's paid for great wonderful so we didn't pay it back we just or forward behind us we just drove off anyway about a week later i was out with them again and i said oh you know we should we should do this whoever's behind us at the tim's will pay for their stuff yeah so we roll in pay for our stuff I'm like, we'll pick up the order behind. I look in my rear view mirror. It is a guy in a like $120,000 Lexus <laughs> in the sharpest suit I've ever seen in Halifax, but we paid for it. So I, I get this, um, well, whatever what is, this what is was, I aim degree here. Guy. They were going to pay for their stuff. Yes. You're, really, you're really changing the community with that, what you did for that guy. Wasn't I? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And And, you know, maybe he didn't tip the staff because of it, so he just drove off. So yeah, yeah. I, I agree. What do you think there? Pay the... Tip the staff, don't pay it forward. Yeah, For talking of breakfast. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, tip the staff. I'll I'll be the first to say in those scenarios, the quick service like a Tim's, a McDonald's, even a coffee shop. Like this morning, I won't disclose where I was, but of course, I bought my coffee and I had the iPad turned around and it gave me seven tip options. I hit no tip. I just don't think that that warrants a tip, in my opinion. Not not to you be are rude. a monster. Not to be rude, but. No, I, I don't think it's it's. Ne- I mean, maybe if you already have your if you're just getting a coffee, you have your tuni out, and you're like, oh, whatever, I'll pay it forward to the employee. That's fine. Um, I want to I want to go. Whoever made my coffee, the first coffee, it was good. I'll give them a, an extra little tip. But I don't know. Yeah, that's that's one way of looking at it. You can pay it forward to the cashier. You can pay it forward to pay it backwards, I guess, to the uh, person behind you. Um, I saw one comment. So speaking of employees, comment from Steamed Hams eighty seven. Again, I don't know who makes these names. 87 steamed hams or was that user born in 1987? There's a, there's a material difference there. There's something to find out there. I mean, my, my name on Reddit is Crafty Steak. So last time I ended the pay it forward chain, the employee thanked me profusely. He told me I had no idea how annoying and disruptive to their flow it is. I can understand that. I can understand how it can get messy. Um, you're given the order. Like you're not taking, you're taking money from someone else's order. The change is different. Um, I read on, I, I didn't, I don't have a comment saved, but I read one where someone said, oh yeah, I'll pay it. I'll pay for the coffee behind me. And they go, I'll pay for the order behind me. And they said, okay, their order was $30. Um, I this might- was this, yeah, this is actually user, uh, Florida Panther. Or I think it was Florida Panther said last time someone did this for me, I moaned and said, I get the coffees for the car behind me. The cashier said that'll be $29. So they said they'll cover their coffee, but not the food. And then the cashier said, well, I can't just charge you for the coffee. It would need to be the whole order. So the user said, forget it and uh, not paying for a family of four for breakfast. Yeah, completely, completely get that. You know, I'm a family of two. Uh, the dog eats our food when we go through Tim's. <laughs> he has a little bit of the donut and a little yeah. bit of the sandwich. Yeah. So it's cheap for us. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, I like the idea that somebody else brought up here, which is that there's some indie coffee shops that have token systems. So you buy the coffee, and then you can also buy a token which you put into a bowl and anybody who is impoverished or needy or, or, or is unable to pay for their order can come in and take a token and get a free coffee. So you're actually paying it forward to the community, to somebody who can't pay um, or doesn't feel they want to pay. Uh, aside, you know, not just the guy behind you who is going to tap his debit card on the machine. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Like I, I pretty much always pay with debit or like with my phone and just tapping. And another funny thing about that is 
you never really like I, I find I never actually look at the machine to double check what I'm paying. Right. So like if, if you're not even checking the machine, do you really care? Maybe you are just it's just whatever, tap and go, oh, is it mine? Is it theirs? Who cares? Yeah. Whatever. Um, but it's funny, like I started thinking, I was like, you know what, someone could charge me like fifty bucks for a coffee and I wouldn't even notice because I just I just go beep and it just taps. I don't even look at the screen. Right. Beep. We just had a good discussion with with our guest, John Wedderburn, uh, off air about AI. And I think we need to, be, he had some really great opinions. I think we need to bring him back and, and hash out the AI stuff. So so that was the the Tim's discussion. There was another one, right, as well, about a, tw- a 21 gun salute. Yes, the 21 gun salute. Do you want me to read that one out? I, let me see if I have that uh, title. No, I don't have the title. So you read it out. I got some comments. Sure. And it was posted by, Na- and this is actually a really good one Naughty Girl, Ooh. but N A U T I. So a take on both Naughty Girl and a take on Nautical. Naughty Girl. Whoa, let's get her on yeah. the podcast. Naughty Girl, we need you on the podcast. So what's that noise? Are we under attack? Here's the answer, was the title. Um, the Reddit post, today starting sometime after 10, closer to 10.30, I think, there will be a 21-gun salute from Citadel Hill marking the coronation of King Charles III. Now use this information to go forth and confidently and accurately answer the 20 threads that will be posted <laughs> asking what's this noise did you know alec if you come to uh, me uh, you join me in, in the morning at the gym you can see the two gun salute oh that's a good one <laughs> that 21 gun salute went down i was confused i feel out of touch that i did not realize what it was for because you live right next to i live right next to it i have another funny story about that in a second um yeah but i i didn't realize what it was i'm looking out the window like what the, are they are they blasting i'm like they can't be blasting because they're supposed to be a uh, a horn that goes off before that <laughs> That was really good. That was really good. So actually, it isn't a horn. I just go down there and do that into a microphone. Oh, I, I figured. It sounded man-made. Um, I, I, I can't even do a good horn. That's a very good horn, man. You, you have, have a career. Oh, there's many sounds you I can do career, you don't know about. You have a career in horning. Um, so I, uh, I didn't know what it was. I was confused. And it wasn't until I read this article when we prepped for this podcast that I was like, oh, that makes sense now. Um, I saw a funny comment. Actually, no, before I get into that, Yes, James, you made a good point. I live right next to the cannons and where they did the 21 guns, so right, right next to the Citadel. You live in the Citadel, right? In, For, up in one of those old... Me and Mr. Adams old, were, bunk, uh, barracks. Were, were bunkmates. You're uh, bunkmates with Mr. Adams. Uh, that's a throwback. Uh, we'll get him back here on Halloween. Um, but uh, yeah, so but the thing is, I've been there for two years now. We're moving in another month here to, to our house, but I've been there for two years, and I never, ever get used to that cannon going off. And it literally makes me jump sometimes if I'm outside walking. Uh, the other day, uh, the other I'd love day, to see that. <laughs> oh man! Uh, I bet Jenna, this is Alex' fiance, just slaps you and is like, "God damn, we've living here for two years." I know. But when I used to live in Dartmouth, I could I could hear it every day. We lived in Russell Lake for years. Oh yeah, and I could literally hear it, you know, across the water. She gets spooked by it too. The other day, we were walking the two of us, and it went off. And we both leapt out of our feet. Uh, but it was funny. Out of your feet, uh, left out. So just stumps were flying, or what? <laughs> I'd love to. As long as you land back in them, I then just, it's okay. I just left my feet on the ground. <laughs> uh, just picturing that is funny. But I was walking by Citadel Hill, and uh, another broker uh, had called me. Um, and I'm a good guy. I know him. And I, it was 11:59 when he called me, and I was like, "All right." Like I'm walking by Citadel Hill. I knew the cannon was coming, but I wanted to answer the call. Or I was on my way to the office. I was like, well, "This is a good time to answer the call." So I answered, and I just said, hey, Tim. Okay, now you know who it is. I said, hey, Tim, I just got to give you a little heads up here. I'm walking by Citadel Hill. It's 11.59. The cannon's going to go off soon. So if you hear a big bang, that's what it is. And then we just started talking. We started talking. And then I knew it was coming. And lo and behold, 12 goes, boom. And I went, holy. Insert, holy what? Holy. Insert, holy fridge? Do your horn sound. Holy. <laughs> Exactly. That's that's what I said. I, I still jumped, and he didn't miss a beat. He just kept he just kept rolling. But I was like, "Damn!" Like I couldn't even pull myself together for two seconds on a phone call, knowing that cannon was coming. <laughs> um, anyway, skipping it. I don't want to get too lost on the cannon. My cannons. Um, well, we had a very angry, um, very angry redditor, Infidel C one two three said, "What a stupid thing." I wish I never had to hear about the royal family again in my life. He would be thrilled to know that Prince, uh, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, is actually in New Brunswick this month in a couple of weeks. Ooh. So uh, he, was, he was very disgruntled about the existence of the royal family in, in general. He was not gruntled. I, I got a comment from Candy Most Dandy, uh, the Goose Whisperer. Huh. Someone said, I'm trying to bribe them to aim directly at my office. And then Blaze Fallon's late... 
Lace Felons. It says, I was hoping for my apartment. Maybe we can split it. I'll even give you 11 shots and I'll settle for the other 10. Then Candy Most Dandy said, they wouldn't take my bribe. They have such a vendetta against the sky. I don't know why. <laughs> Lace Fallon said, thanks for trying. And someone said, good plan. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Trying to bribe them to aim directly at my Well, office. there's no cannonballs, just to be clear. There are no cannonballs in the cannons. No balls of any kind in those cannons. So you, you're, getting a, you're getting an historical shot, not a book cannonball shot that could have gone very wrong if i'd minced my words mm. but um mm. you know it, it is just basically a sound effect but very loud there is some story as well about when the g7 was here in like 95 97 the secret service came and, and they weren't briefed on the midday cannon so president clinton was actually a few feet away from where we are he was down at summit place just behind us and the noon cannon went off and the secret service attempted to dive on him thinking that it was some kind of attack, some threat. Oh, my gosh. It's an unverified Halifax legendary story. So uh, we know that Bill Clinton is a frequent listener. So um, yes. I call him Will. Not We have first name terms, like short. He's Billy to me. Billy so, to you, Billy yeah. Will, whatever you have. Like, just just give us a call, let us Billy know. Billy Clint, yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. Uh, and send a, send a private jet, too. I'll make a donation to the Clinton Absolutely. Fund. Absolutely, $45. Um, I have another comment here. This is like what the funny part about Reddit is. It obviously has nothing to do with the topic, really. But it's just funny how off on a tangent somebody could go. It reminds me of the one where we did a Reddit roundup where somebody went off on a tangent about how they cooked their ribs, and then everyone started chiming in on how they cooked their ribs. This one said, uh, their name was, okay, here we go. Thrasemakian, Thrasemakian Justice said, yay, terrifying birds. Silent resident, not so silent. Can birds <laughs> feel terror? And then... Uh, Thracian Justice said, supposing they aren't government spies, I'd say they do, sure. They react in fear to threatening gestures, display wariness, etc. Crows and ravens are especially pretty clever. Lots of studies suggest they display a wide range of complex emotions. Well, they tore up the effing grass this uh, spring on my front yard. Oh. Yeah. Oh, you should take so 21 guns well. to them. I should. There's, bang, I wish bang, I had bang, one. Bang, bang. There's people that also believe the uh, that COVID was the batteries being replaced in pigeons. So the story goes that in in the 60s when urban pigeons became very became very prevalent around the world because people fed them and they were roosting. Yes. Um, that they put they were actually were were drones that had microphones and cameras uh. in them to spy on people. And and the batteries had like a 40 50 year lifespan and the batteries ran out. So the only way to replace them so that global government could keep spying on people was to make everybody go indoors so they could go pigeon by pigeon and open up the battery cover uh. and replace them. And the only way to do that was to scare us into thinking that there was a disease that if we go out in public, we might see. Now, this is total BS. But if you are bored and you ever want to go down an internet rabbit hole, Google the COVID conspiracy of replacing the batteries in the pigeons. I was like, and, down this rabbit hole. Oh, there are, I mean, millions of web pages. There are people who have gone so deep into the evidence, but... Looney tunes. Loonies, but they are out there. So there's a government drone, right? Oh, just a pigeon. Oh, well, you never, you never know. Um, yeah, so do you, if you have any other comments, I have one to finish off on for this one. Like comments in general or no, 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 in, uh, in life? Because I, I have plenty of, <laughs> like, plenty you have of opinions. some life advice for me, James? Life um, advice for you, Alec, will be um, that it is easier to clean your car inside to, for 10 minutes every Sunday than it is to clean a disastrous vehicle twice a year. Interesting. I appreciate it. One tip I gave my wife this weekend. I'm full of tips. You gave her a tip, eh? Um, I, got a, I got a life advice for you. Go for okay, it. Okay, ready? Never, for any reason, ever, for no particular reason ever ever think or do for any reason <laughs> i know where this is going <laughs> of all time you know never ever think that you ever would ever never think of uh, ever just don't and that's my advice to you <laughs> I, I that's so wide-ranging <laughs> I mean, the other one is just simply pay your taxes. David, I thought you were going down the Michael Scott... Um, I forgot the rest of the line. David, here it is. My philosophy is basically this, and this is something that I live by, and I always have, and I always will. Don't ever, for any reason, do anything to anyone, for any reason, ever, no matter what, no matter where or who or who you are with or or where you are going or or where you've been 
ever, for any reason whatsoever. Sometimes I'll start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way, like an improv conversation. But that's where you were going, right? That's, that's the joke. Um, my last comment from the Reddit post from Swimming Barracuda, in quotations from the 21, people doing the 21 gun salute. Just doing my part to bring rent down. Oh, <laughs> that's a whole other topic. we got to hit the housing crisis it, on this podcast at some point. So thank you. What was the username for, for reminding us? Swimming Barracuda 65. <laughs> Swimming Barracuda 65. Um, also, happy birthday, Kyle. Uh, my buddy Kyle, it's his birthday today. He Is turns, it really Kyle's birthday turns already? He 26 years old. Because he had one last year, didn't he? He had one last year. It's come around already, uh, May 16th. Um, happy for you, buddy. Hope you have a great birthday. And uh, I hope he's, you know, he's a big fan of, uh, big fan of birds. He loves uh, bird watching and uh, he has a lot of photos he collects and it's uh, kind of a hobby of his. So a so, twitcher is the technical name for someone a who, twitcher, I guess. Who, who, uh, who loves birds. But, but so, is, he, is he part of the battery changing crew or is he just a, a fan? Uh, that I don't know about. I'd, that'd be, that'd if he's be got a bunch of double A's in his pocket every time out, you see him, he must like every day replace a few bird batteries. That makes sense. He's usually out looking for birds all the time and, and new ones. So I, I do hope he, he sees some today on his birthday. Best of luck with Well, that, they Kyle. hang around in bars, right? So yeah, I, he's, he's quite a fan of the birds, uh, yeah. apparently. So place to be in the summer. Yes, sir. Well, that was another episode. Did you know that um, Matter of Facts is the most widely listened to Halifax-based podcast that was recorded in this studio prior to 11 a.m. today? Isn't really? That, that's, that's how well we've done over the last year. Wow. Amazing stat. I mean, no one can compete with that. Um, yeah, no, this was a great, great, good start to season. A nice, soft start to season two. John was an incredible guest to have on. Um, we're really looking forward to season two. Going forward, we're looking out today. It is beautiful on the boardwalk. Uh, very much looking forward to some different things we're going to try out this summer with Matter of Facts. We love trying new things. We do. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions, comments, concerns, topics you want to hear or guests you'd like us to try and get on, I mean, we, we had the premiere on last month. We are not afraid to really push and try and see who we can get on this podcast. And if you think you'd like to be on here and maybe... Uh, have a topic to discuss, a voice to be heard. We are all ears. Please reach out to us on all of our socials and uh, or HalifaxPodcast at gmail.com. We get and you our... can also send Western Union Venmo and PayPal payments to us too. Yes, please. Uh, pay any, for our anything coffees. is accepted. We take it in $1,000 increments. We do not provide tax receipts. Correct. Um, but uh, thanks again, everyone, for listening. <laughs> <laughs> so I just whacked my cell phone off the Over You know there. what's funny was was the number of times every week I want to just slam my phone down, and I can't because I'm a professional, and then I just randomly do it at the last 30 seconds I, when of the I, If I do it, I, it's only if I'm ever home, working from home, and I can throw it at a pillow. I once broke a phone on a coffee table. I, I, I got screwed by a client, and it was fairly new in my career, and I was so angry. I ran downstairs, and I threw my phone and it hit the corner of the coffee table and, of course, just demolished the screen. Yikes. So that was one of those times when... It's actually it's like Andy punching the wall. Oh, that was yeah. an overreaction. That was a funny The funny second one. that happened, my wife was like, okay, that is never happening in this house ever again. And I said, that will never happen ever again. Yeah. And I changed the way I approached clients who screw you. So what was that whole punching the table this morning then? What was that all about? Oh, did you see that? You got that phone call and you punched the table. There's a hole in it right now. I'm looking Should have seen the other guy. Ah, yeah. shit. Not worth getting screwed by a client. Your word choice today has been awesome, by the way. You think? You've had some great word choice today. It's going to make for really funny content and really subliminal messaging. It's going to be perfect. Well, what you don't know is in today's episode, we've dropped enough hints that we have actually hidden $100,000 somewhere around the city. And if you go yes. back and listen to this podcast and you can put the clues together, uh, we will lead you to a hidden Tupperware container containing the cash. So for, yeah. our, for our guests, that, uh, for, sorry, for our listeners, that is the um, task for you is to go and re-listen to this, piece it together and, and find the money. Come one, come all. <laughs> <laughs>